Hi. Hello. How's it going? All good. Can you so hear far? me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for Great. helping us. I, I, we've seen that you're uh, active on the moderators channel, answering questions. So, <laughs> so uh, just answer one. <laughs> yes, Java or .NET, and your answer was. Oh, my answer is that I mean. There is nothing preventing going to Java if you really want, but uh, you should make a proof of concept in order to uh, understand whether it's better Java or .NET for your project. It's, there is no one, a universal decision, of course. So uh, one of the reasons why uh, I, I love .NET is the ability to have some tools that really can make a huge difference. One of these is power uh, generation of code. So we have the C-sharp compiler that lets you parse and generate new code. And this is a, a really Swiss army knife that um, maybe it's useful to uh, glue certain uh, architectural pieces and can avoid monkey typing uh, and several waste of time. Uh, I mean, there are there are many options with that and uh, I will talk briefly in my session about uh, code generation because there is something new in .NET 5 from this perspective and it's something that Java doesn't have but I mean uh, if you need it it's okay if you don't need it maybe there is something else in Java that you may want to uh, to leverage so but for the time yeah. being let, let's stick with .NET right <laughs> yeah for the next two days of course right. of course there are many, many things to say. Will will we'll phase off me and then, and we'll leave the floor uh, open for you. Guys. Okay. So, just tell me when I uh, you want uh, me to to share the the screen. Yeah, or Dino, if you want to add anything. Uh, before no, the I'm just that I'm, I'm curious to, um, to to learn more in detail to see uh, in, in action or, or, or new, to, to find explained uh, uh, the new stuff in C sharp. I, I honestly, for, for many years, my perspective on languages was okay. A, any version of C sharp I get out of the box with Visual Studio is good enough. Uh, but only recently I changed my mind and I pointed that in, in, my, hum, in my humble opinion uh, final slide that um, that using the latest version of the language gives you more power, more expressivity at least, and turns your code into something that is more readable. And uh, so, so I'm curious to see what's, what's new, especially the, this new records type and the nullability in, in announced in C sharp nine, so uh, I hope to learn more and especially about these two aspects of C sharp. Yeah, and I think uh, Rafael is the right person to learn Hopefully, this. From. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember because I I, I reviewed his, his book on uh, on C sharp uh, C sharp eight, so I, I'm pretty. I'm, I think that we are in, in very good hands. Thank okay. you, Dina. <laughs> Rafael, you so, have the floor. Uh, okay, I will share my screen. Yeah, it's all yours. OK, let's go. So. Yeah, so you can hear me, you can see me. Is all everything good. OK? OK, let's start. So this session is about uh, a kind of a continuation of the discussions that uh, you already heard from from Dino. Uh, that is very central to make decision to whether uh, adopt uh, .NET 5 uh, or, or not, or what, what's happening in, in this space. So I want to talk to you about the, the, the tools, the powers, the, the things that you have in .NET 5 and C Sharp 9. And so, OK, I know that you maybe already know me, but uh, I'm going to briefly introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, Raffaele. Uh, I am a software architect. Uh, I work with many companies uh, in the context of a consultant. Uh, I also drive uh, uh, the, the software uh, division of, of my company. And then, um, uh, I mean, I had several experiences uh, through uh, the industries in, in many different uh, scenarios. The most recent is manufacturing and fi financial, but uh, it was fun to to work with people in the healthcare then and racing uh, with the Formula One. And it's amazing to see so many different uh, uh, 
things that and problems that can be solved in different ways. And of course, I'm speaker and trainer. You already saw me many times in, in a code camp, but through uh, many other uh, countries. And so that uh, I, I just celebrated my 16th uh, uh, award uh, of the MVP and uh, it's a long time I missed the MVP summit I, we hope that this moment of the pandemic we will end very soon but let's go on so uh, um, first of all I had the occasion to uh, obtain from uh, my editor uh, um, this code this promotional code 25 C sharp which is a code for a discount that uh, anyone interested in the book can have a, a good discount uh, on both Amazon and directly on the editors. And uh, thanks to Dino for, uh, for the foreword of, and uh, he introduced the book uh, very nicely. I, I love it, this. Uh, this author, um, book is authored um, together with good friends, Marius and Anne Kitt. Uh, we had a, a good time together in, in sharing knowledge and uh, uh, discuss the things, the topics, and, and write down all the content, which is updated to C Sharp 8, of course, because, I mean, uh, time passes, and in just a few months later, we already uh, have C Sharp 9. We will see uh, future updates. Who knows? So, uh, I will continue from... Uh, the Dino conversation uh, with .NET 5 very briefly because he already covered all the topics that are very relevant to understand how to, to pick uh, uh, the version and uh, what to do, what can you, can, you can do with uh, uh, .NET in uh, the new release of, that, of, of .NET Core that is, of course, uh, the unique version that now we have. Uh, from the practical perspective, we have uh, just to install uh, the, the, the SDK as, a, as developers and uh, everything works fine. You know, you, you can go in self-contained uh, deployment and uh, not even install the runtime on the publishing machine, which is, which is good. You can go in production without even touching the application, uh, anything else. Uh, nothing more than going and then X copy your application with all the, the runtime in, in a single folder, which is a very powerful way to go in production. There is a slightly different uh, TFM schema. What are the TFMs? Are those things that are specified inside of the target framework in uh, your CSproj file? This means that um, they have a slightly different meanings, but nothing was changed uh, dramatically. I mean, it's very easy. So you remember Netcore app, and this is uh, still true for the past version. So for Netcore 3.1, for example, you can still use Net Netcore app, which refers to them, and uh, Net Standard, of course. And we will briefly talk about Net Standard in a moment. But uh, with .NET 5, they introduced a, a new uh, way to um, specify also the operating system and version of the operating system. This is important because we know from Dino that now we have a unified .NET 5 using, uh, uh, or merging, uh, started merging all the C uh, CLRs, uh, the Mono one and uh, uh, the Unity one and so on, the, the summary in, uh, initiative, everything in a single core. Uh, this unification will uh, complete with .NET 6, but uh, of course we need uh, already to specify uh, which is the version that, uh, of, of the operating system that you want to target in order to correctly use uh, the capabilities that are specific to the operating system. So if you want to use uh, WPF and Windows form, of course you can. You, you could already with uh, .NET Core 3.1 and uh, now uh, you just specify dash Windows uh, in addition to .NET 5.0 in order to specify to the runtime that you want to leverage that specific uh, capabilities of on Windows. We know that WinForm and WPF is not, is not cr cross-platform because it has uh, huge dependencies uh, on the Windows operating system, of course. 
And there is an additional thing that um, it's important that you will remember until the end of this session, at least, because uh, by specifying the version of the operating system, the full version, as you see in, uh, in the second row here, is uh, a way to specify which SDK you want to leverage uh, when you write an application. And this is very important when you want to use the full new API, which is the WinRT API, that is the same API that you already use in UWP applications, even if you want to build, a, let's say, a console. I mean, for example, you have to write a console application that want to uh, discover the location of, of, of the of the machine or maybe talk uh, using uh, the, the Bluetooth and so on. And you need the capabilities of the local operating system so you can do this uh, in automatically. And we will see uh, how uh, easy is becoming this in .NET 5. And also we can specify the Android and iOS uh, operating systems which is, uh, I mean, uh, the very building, basic building block in order to unify the, the whole uh, .NET uh, framework uh, uh, pieces uh, that we had uh, uh, in the past with Xamarin and Mono and, and so on into a single uh, unique uh, way of developing application. Uh, of course, uh, we also had uh, net standard. Net standard uh, has been very, very useful uh, to allow uh, any library to be shared across uh, different uh, uh, runtimes. And of course, still it's very useful because if you want, uh, if you are a, are a library uh, author and you want to share uh, your library with even people that is still targeting Windows Phone, for example you still have to use net standard as uh, the way to create binaries that can be used across uh, the greatest number of platform. This means that basically if you are a library author, you want to target the lowest uh, net standard uh, version as possible. For example, JSON.NET still targets uh, net standard 1.0 because it uh, tries to avoid any dependencies uh, on the platform, so they want to target uh, as much as possible and uh, decided to, to go uh, with the lowest number to, to, to satisfy this requirement. But uh, uh, if you can cut away some of the platforms and uh, you can find the specification, the full specification of the versions on the net standard uh, repository uh, on GitHub and the Microsoft uh, on the Microsoft uh, repository of, of in GitHub, you can see uh, which are the APIs that are available or not. Well, uh, the most important thing to remember is that uh, the 2.0 version is the very last net standard that you can use to target uh, uh, the .NET framework. So you, if you have anything you want to share with .NET framework, you for sure you have to target not net standard 2.0. That's extremely important. Uh, as soon as you want to cut away uh, that .NET standard, um, uh, sorry, .NET framework, you can uh, use .NET standard 2.1. And this is useful because you may want to share the library with uh, Mono, with Xamarin, with .NET Core 3.1 and so on. So it's a very small, a uh, number of runtimes that you want to share with, but uh, it's still a, 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 a real possibility. As soon as you are fine with uh, going further and and uh, go with just .NET 5, uh, you, you don't have to bother with .NET standard anymore. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It, it was a transition thing, we know. Uh, in, in a few years from now, we will forget about .NET standard. So uh, it's not that interesting in, a, in, a, in the long terms. So that is the main uh, advantage. Of course, as soon as you go in a pure uh, .NET Core environment and, uh, and so .NET uh, 3 or 5, uh, it's pretty obvious that you have a lot of the new stuff that you can't use uh, 
in uh, in dotnet framer for example so it's a good choice whether you want uh, for example uh, go with uh, the span of t the nullable uh, things uh, notation and so on that doesn't exist on uh, the dotnet framework so uh, it, you you have the choice you have to to think about for a moment if you are a library router you have to stay very low otherwise go uh, with the full dotnet core and and uh, you will enjoy many many uh, apis uh, one of the most important example is uh, the system text JSON. So, uh, this is, a, I mean, one of the new stuff that uh, has been produced uh, in uh, ASP.NET Core uh, because they really wanted to be in the very top for be the fastest uh, uh, framework uh, in, in the web. And uh, in order to be among the, the, the on the top ten, and you can see the the benchmarks uh, by for, by yourself. I mean, it, it's not important to be the first, the second, or the third. And I mean, I, I don't care too much. You are in the top ten, and it's uh, uh, really the best throughput, the uh, highest number of concurrent uh, clients, the highest number of requests that you can make to the to the framework. This is extremely important because uh, they had to uh, take every single bit of advantage they can. And uh, this was possible also because they replaced the, uh, the, the uh, JSON.NET with the system text JSON. And believe me, uh, JSON.NET is a very powerful library. It's a very performant library. But of course, since they, uh, the, the author uh, had to write down uh, the library that satisfied the, the widest number of uh, um, of, of the um, runtimes. It's important uh, not to use certain APIs. While system text JSON uh, tried to uh, cut a bit of uh, of compatibility and tried to uh, make uh, the most of the newest thing. This means uh, basically two things. The first uh, is that um, is, uh, the, in, with the .NET 5, now we have a mature serializer and the serializer. And finally, uh, after a popular request, uh, we obtained uh, the support for SQL references, the extension methods for the HTTP client, which is one of the most popular uh, usage. And uh, they are already uh, with the development with the, the C Sharp 9 feature. So support for immutable types, the records that we will see in a moment. And uh, also uh, a lot of uh, other good th uh, things. So I want to just show you the code uh, that is uh, very important to understand uh, the power of .NET 5 and this library comparing uh, uh, a list that contains uh, a graph. And this is uh, serialized, uh, so th these are the micro benchmark uh, made with benchmark.net, which is a really good library developed uh, from many good friends. Uh, .NET Core has this performance profile. So we have JSON.NET and uh, for, uh, for uh, 50 microseconds uh, against 12. Uh, this is a really good difference. But even more, if you compare uh, these numbers with the uh, .NET Framework 4.8, you see that uh, there is a big advantage in going to .NET Core. So this is .NET Core 5. Okay, it's .NET 5. A and uh, it's more performant. Why? because they could make uh, optimizations that uh, it's very risky to do in .NET Framework because they, they risk to, to make breaking changes and we don't want to, to have breaking changes. Uh, of course, .NET Core can live side by side, so if you are not satisfied with this one, you can just uh, modify your global JSON and uh, use a different version of .NET Core. It's more agile, it's easier, and so, uh, you, you cannot do optimization here, but you can uh, make it here. A and this is a great result. Uh, conversely, in the, the, the serialization, uh, we have even more important uh, uh, 
performance results, which makes uh, that, uh, that, that, that new library from Microsoft uh, very, very performant. So uh, these are numbers that uh, uh, should tell you that if you have a .NET framework application and you need performance, that's the way to go. And this new library is just an example of how the entire ecosystem is growing. Let's go now to the language, which is extremely important. Uh, the language journey uh, has evolved in uh, many different uh, aspects over the versions. I don't want to go back uh, in the six, the five, or, or even the, the first version of the language because it, it would take too time, too much time. But uh, in uh, version seven, that there are three versions of the seven zero, seven one two three. So there are uh, different version of uh, the seven and the eight. Uh, improved uh, the language in very important scenarios that are extremely important. Uh, the, the first one is uh, making the uh, code more compact, uh, reducing the boilerplate, which is something that is happening more and more often because we need to write important code, not boilerplate. The boilerplate is very useful, but uh, it's tedious and it's boring. And we also want the code to be more readable because when some, uh, someone new in the team reaches us and uh, start coding, he wants, uh, we want him to automatically enter the project without have uh, any effort and in, in not uh, having to read too many comments to understand what is going on there and so on. Also writing more performant code uh, with the imageability, the memory management uh, in version 7, 1 through 3, we had seen um, many of them with span of T and memory of T and so on, and constructs to write a more robust code that is uh, extremely important. What's new? Uh, let's take uh, a popular problem example. We have a simple class that is called customer. We have a default constructor, which uh, uh, is important for serializers. Then uh, we often have to write this uh, specific constructor in order to populate in a simpler way uh, the, the properties, but also because this is not possible if you make the uh, properties only get. Why? Because this is an initializer and this means that basically we have customer is a new customer and then it's, it's like writing customer.id equals one, two, three, four and customer.name equals blah, blah, blah and so on. We, uh, we don't have uh, a parity between the constructor and the initializer. We want to uh, the mutability maybe. And uh, this is something that has been addressed how. The init only setters are new type of accessors uh, that um, uh, allow you to replace the set accessor and uh, establish a shorter uh, lifetime in which you can initialize in when you can initialize the properties. So basically what we have here. We have the ID name and address that instead of having a setter or making private uh, the, the setter, we just have in it. So uh, this means that we have a new construction phase, which is limited in time, uh, after which the setter will not more be accessible anymore. Uh, this uh, is possible, uh, therefore, uh, initialize the, the object using the default constructor and uh, with the initializer, because the compiler knows that uh, we are still building the object. But if you try to access those properties in, in, uh, in write, uh, you will not be able to. Be and the compiler will complain. And this is important because if, if uh, the compiler is warning you that is not important, you have a clear message and there is no bug that can fake you at runtime. So we have a really uh, well-defined situation in which the construction phase is slightly more uh, uh, broader than, than what we had before. And this uh, is a nice feature that merges well with records. Records uh, is um, 
you don't have to see with, with fear. I mean, uh, many people, from the first time you see records, oh, I'm, uh, I, I had structs, uh, I have classes, and now we have records. Records uh, are just classes, so there is uh, uh, still the concept of value type, a reference type, and records are a reference type that give you uh, some uh, advantage in terms uh, of uh, uh, rep data representation. Why? Basically, it means that when you use record instead of class, uh, you are uh, asking uh, the compiler to generate some boilerplate code. And there is a lot of code that you may want to generate uh, for you. Uh, the first is that uh, you, if you write down uh, uh, the the, the more, most compact form, the default for records it is to have immutable properties which are marked as init with the new accessor. The second is that uh, it's ready uh, with, a, uh, let's say, a way to copy the, the object that is very similar to what happens in structs. So the the semantic of the copy that you have built in inside the records is the same of the structs, so it's, it's a shallow copy, it's not a, a, a deep copy. And it's very important because you may want to have a clone of your object, but still preserving uh, the references uh, to the common object, to the common hierarchy. Uh, deep, deep, uh, deep clone is something that, that is uh, scary. I mean, in terms of performance, it's very scary. Um, then you gain also uh, ready to use the two string implementation with the, all the detailed properties that build up your uh, record which is uh, very powerful because you avoid to build uh, interpolated strings or with a lot of uh, fields and so on. And also a full uh, I equitable uh, of T implementation. That means that you also have the operators to compare your records. And uh, this comparison uh, is extremely powerful and I will uh, show you in a moment. What is the record? The record in action is that we have a record called a person and uh, also a, a construct, we can specify the constructor uh, directly on the declaration. So in this case, it's like having a record person and then declare inside the, the braces that you can still do, of course, uh, the constructor that take uh, uh, the in, uh, ID, first name and last name. And um, if you uh, pay attention, you see that uh, I am uh, using the uppercase notation here. And the reason is that uh, the compiler will use these exact names to create the properties. So basically we have a class that uh, has three properties and they are with a getter, of course, but also an init accessor. Uh, then we have another record that derives from person. And uh, you can see here the, that is pretty familiar because it's similar uh, to what we do with, uh, with the classes. Then uh, we have um, a new uh, operator that is, is called with. And uh, this with is uh, very powerful because it uh, allows you to create a new uh, club, uh, similar <laughs> record with just a few differences. So basically it means that then is a record which has a, an ID of two instead of one and whose first name is Daniele. Okay. Uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, very popular feature because uh, often we have to build an object that differs just in few things. Uh, and this uh, syntax uh, is targeting uh, this need. And also, uh, it's very important to record the equality. So we said uh, that the compiler gives us for free the equitable uh, of T and implements uh, for us. So what we get here, this means that basically I already have a customer named Raffaele Rialdi, okay? I have a person, a new person that is here built with the same exact property values. 
And I also have a customer that is created with the same property value uh, values. But the rough uh, reference is different than the person rough and is equal to the customer rough because uh, the equality, of course, checks uh, also the, uh, the inheritance, quindi the type that uh, uh, the data belongs to. And th this is automatically generated from the compiler. Another feature, and uh, maybe if you have time at the end, I will show also the IELTS Pi for all the stuff, uh, is uh, the covariant retors. Uh, this is something that uh, when I saw, I, I mean, I finally, I, I mean, it's something that I uh, has a weird name because co covariance uh, is something that um, not everybody understand when we, we first talk about it, but it's definitely something that you expect uh, that happens and works this way. So what is the scenario here? Uh, we have uh, the interface IRChive and uh, two classes that uh, just inherit uh, this interface and implement this interface, file and memory archive. Okay. On the other uh, end, we have an abstract class called storage. And uh, we have two, two methods, the create archive and the read archives. And this is uh, returns an I enumerable. It's important that it is an I enumerable and not, not an I list, of course, because of the covariant uh, stuff. And what I can do now is that I can implement a new storage, a concrete storage, uh, by returning a more specialized, uh, more, most derived, the most specialized uh, class that is relevant for the file storage. So when I create an archive, I will receive the file archive if I am doing this on the file storage. And the same will happen on the memory archive, of course, where I can specify here uh, memory archive and new memory archive and I enumerable memory archive and new list of memory archive. This is extremely powerful. Uh, it's something that if you are familiar with the Roslyn API, the C sharp compiler happens very, very often with uh, because uh, it's basically uh, the reason is that they enforce the, the immutability of the, the whole uh, uh, abstract syntax tree. And so if you have immutable types, you may want from an object to create a new instance of an object representing the change that you are making to the, that object. And if you are uh, implementing an interface that, just, uh, that is just uh, create, or clone or copy or something like that. Uh, of course, uh, you cannot specify the most derived because there are, the hierarchy can be very large and you want to uh, use the very basic uh, implementation uh, uh, definition that is storage. And, and that's the reason why uh, the covariant returns uh, uh, ha has make sense. Uh, it's important because uh, we are uh, walking uh, on the road of the immutability and uh, this allows you to open new doors because now that we have the asynchronicity, we have the concurrent programming and so on, these kind of features makes a huge difference when you uh, try to enforce the immutability. Uh, another very nice feature that we have is the enhancement on, on the pattern matching. The mat pattern matching is something that uh, literally changes the way we write the uh, the code uh, on uh, on our uh, on our code. Um, there are so many features related to pattern matching in the latest uh, versions, uh, so for starting from uh, uh, new stuff with is and uh, with the uh, improved uh, switch expression and, and so on. So it's extremely important. One of the things that uh, is very tedious is every uh, every time you have to specify the is to understand whether an object is uh, a specific type, when you have to negate, uh, you have to put your parenthesis and then the exclamation mark in front of the parenthesis. Otherwise, you, you can uh, 
the, the exclamation mark is not clear what uh, is referencing to. But now with the not <laughs> written uh, explicitly, it, uh, it becomes uh, a, a new pattern. And so these patterns are growing, uh, uh, are improving the way we explain the compiler that we want to return true every time the, this object is not as a decimal and it's very clear and the message is also clear to new people approaching uh, uh, the, the language. I mean, it's, uh, it's fluent. Another uh, pattern that has been added is um, the AND pattern and the OR pattern. So those patterns basically tells you that you can specify uh, a wide range of things. So uh, we will uh, come to the relational pattern as well that are used here, so, so greater equal and uh, uh, less than we equal. But uh, uh, the, let's focus for a moment to the AND and OR. Uh, the AND pattern has a higher precedence, so you, have, you don't have to put the, the braces, but if you want to, you, you are free to, to do, of course. And um, basically we have uh, these combined relational patterns that in very, very easily let you uh, determine whether object uh, is, uh, is a char that is a, a, a letter. <laughs> Frankly, I don't know how to, to say differently. And another uh, different, slightly different way to, to express this concept uh, is using a switch expression. And we already know from C sharp 8 that we can uh, even avoid completely the, the braces for, for um, the method and specify the, the arrow. And the, the arrow uh, uh, follow directly the switch expression. Oh, the, one of the misconceptions is important that the switch expression is different than the, the switch statement. So the statement is something that can also be void. I mean, is void. So you can take decision based on a number of cases. While the switch expression is something that always return a result. So in this case, we are saying, let's consider C and switch over those cases. And uh, as soon as you find the one that matches, you have to return true or false. And uh, this means, is C uh, a letter between uh, a and Z uh, uh, lowercase, okay, let's return true. Or uh, is uppercase, let's return true. And the discard character that is something that is, uh, I don't care, whatever it is, it means that the real meaning is, I don't care of the value, means that you have to return false, a false. And that is basically uh, the same that the default uh, for the, the the classical switch that we already know. And so you have uh, uh, quite a new uh, important relational patterns uh, that greater and lower and, and than equal that uh, are very powerful as well. I mean, you can use it with all the basic types. Uh, so all the predefined types that you have in C sharp. But I warn you that it doesn't work, at least at the moment, we will see in the future, with uh, uh, the operators that has been defined on our custom objects. So even if you define the, the operators uh, on, on your uh, class or, or on your structs, uh, let's say with the point structure and so on, uh, these relation patterns doesn't work with them at the moment. We, I, I don't know if they are planning uh, this, and by, by the way, if you want to follow very closely the discussions and so on, uh, you can. I mean, uh, the, on the GitHub repository, the, the, the C Sharp Lang uh, uh, repository is uh, open to anyone. You can make proposals, you can ask questions, you can see what happens. You, you can just subscribe the entire repository and receive notification as soon as some as soon as something uh, as soon as um, someone is um, is posting or asking something. And uh, by the way, there is no code there. It's just a design, architectural language, language architectural thing. So it's not something that you will 
see uh, the, the, the compiler stuff. The compiler stuff is on the .NET Roslyn repository is open source, of course, with, as anything else, and uh, is, um, is a different thing. So uh, let's see now uh, another important feature that has been added to, uh, to this wave uh, of the framework. Of course, if you are going to try these things at home, <laughs> you can, of course, there is no danger, but uh, be advised that from time to time there are uh, small bugs, uh, a few features that has to be uh, still finished and so on. For example, in uh, RC1, uh, there is a problem with uh, um, the um, the covariant returns. So this feature, if you have uh, this feature in your assembly and you are trying to uh, use reflection, make, uh, getting all the types in your assembly, you will receive uh, an error. And uh, this is not. Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's undesirable, of course. They have broken uh, reflection. It's a, it's a runtime bug, uh, but it's going to be fixed very soon. I mean, in a very few days, weeks, we will see. I mean, uh, in a short time, we will have the final RC2, which is uh, the, the next release. And on November 10, we will have the, the final version. So. Uh, it's not something that you have to be feared too much, but maybe you may find some some issues. Source generators. I you, you should know. I I, told, I had the occasion to talk a few times in Code Camp as well about uh, uh, generating code, and uh, I am very proud to say that is something that is going on uh, uh, over all the industries. I had the occasion to use heavily the uh, power generation uh, code generation features in uh, in uh, in many important projects uh, uh, and uh, with uh, astonishing results i mean you you can really see entire pieces of code that that are produced automatically that are very uh, i mean they are not just uh, a copy of an object to another, and it's something well more complex. And the, the source generators goes in this direction, but give you something that is uh, even one step further. And I want to explain briefly what what's going to happen. Uh, it's a feature that is going to boost the productivity uh, because uh, you will have you will see the the results while you are coding. So. Uh, as soon as you type something, there is this source generator that magically analyzes what you are typing, and even before you compile, uh, you automatically see the results of the code generation. This is uh, something that can happen. Why? Because uh, we have to understand how it works uh, inside the IDE. Inside the IDE, the compiler that gives you the intelligence is something that works continuously. It, every time you type uh, a key, a, a character, or something, you make any kind of changes inside your source code, it, uh, it invokes, uh, the, the, the compiler is invoked in a light way, let's say, so it's not a full compilation, it's uh, the, the first level compiler that uh, understand what are the changes that are, are coming in your code and do something. And uh, what happens under the hood is that they out under the kind of hook so that every time you make it some changes in your code, uh, there is an additional step uh, that happen. This means that the code generator are uh, asked whether they want to generate something. And uh, there are simple rules uh, in order not to make a have collisions on, on what you are doing on, in your code. First of all, they cannot modify source files, so uh, they are not going to change what you are write, uh, writing. Otherwise, it, it will be a mess. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> it's a kind of pair programming with the robot <laughs> close to you. It's uh, oh my God. And um, they can just add new uh, code. This means that, for example, if you want uh, 
to have something generated in the class that you are writing, you have to declare that the, the class is partial because uh, you and the robot and, and Roslyn can work on different uh, units of files and uh, can go on uh, in parallel, which is astonishing. And they can also access uh, additional files in terms that they can be, for example, CSV or your own uh, DSL uh, language or whatever else you may want to add in order to give information or, or to configure uh, your generator. Let's see in details how this works. We have the C Sharp compiler and the C Sharp compiler is doing a lot of stuff. We normally uh, start the compilation and this can happen either if you compile explicitly your solution, but even if you're just typing because the compiler is continuously invoked from the IntelliSense, as, as I mentioned before. As soon as the compiler detects something, the source generator assembly is uh, loaded, invoked and say, hey, there is uh, the, the, your your mate is uh, is going, has written these files. Do you want to intervene in some way? And uh, the, of course, the source generator, if they want, can read additional files specified in the CS project this way. It's very simple. And uh, at this point, there is not a magic keyword that you have to insert to your class while you type in order to specify what uh, the generator is going to uh, analyze. It's, time, it's up to you. It's up to the source generator uh, developer. And uh, let's see a practical example, uh, because as soon as the generator can find that there is something to add to the uh, to the project. They add to the compilation their outcome, which is not even written on file. I mean, it's something that is in memory and goes straight to the last pass of the compil compilation where the binary is uh, compiled. And this is the, the final outcome. So your assembly will uh, contain the code you wrote and the additional stuff that has been generated from the source generator. But this code, the code CS, is not modified at all. Let's see in detail so what happens. So regardless, one, this is a, the first trick, and I want to explain how the popular auto-notify works. Auto-notify is a source generator that will generate for you, attention, will generate for you, the implementation of the I notify property change it, which is something extremely popular. So the first step is saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to generate uh, in any case, regardless of the file being compiled, this attribute, which is called auto notify. This means that you can start using this uh, attribute even if you didn't write, didn't write and, and not even have to write to reference anything in your reference uh, in, the, in your project. So this means that you have um, the, the person, okay? And you can tag your field as auto notify. And uh, finally, your notification will go to the, to the person. And this is what is uh, generated automatically for you. And, and this is astonishing. I mean, it's something unbelievable. Uh, the binary is finally uh, made and, and, and we, uh, we are done. Let me, let me see if I can go straight to another uh, Final uh, thing. Let me see the. I will answer later, of course. Uh, let me see if I want to uh, show you here a nice feature. Okay. Uh, that we have. Just give me five minutes and I am done. 
so uh, there are many other features in C sharp. There are plenty of these features. So there are, I mean, uh, for example, module initialization that is extremely interesting. Uh, the possibility to specify. Uh, extension methods for uh, uh, the get enumerators and so that you can enumerate things that uh, were not designed to and uh, you you have the uh, skips local init not to initialize a large chunk of memory when you stack a lock them uh, for example but one of the things that i want to focus on is uh, the new types that is the, the system half that is a floating point that is 16 bit uh, wide which is extremely important for ML, so the machine learning stuff. There are new types, a NINT and new INT, that is important because they change depending on the platform, so they can be uh, 32 or 64 bits, and they are extremely important. I want, really wanted to show you uh, the, 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 how the, uh, the, the, the function pointer works basically is a revamped version of the reverse p invoke but that now is much easier because there is no cre need to create a, uh, the delegate instance there is a reduced cost overall so no gc uh, involvement there is the direct pointer you have the the, the pointer pointed directly to the JITED code. So the, uh, the performance of some language calling C sharp directly in native code is uh, boom, boom. It's uh, extremely fast and you don't have to, to bother. Uh, unfortunately, in this uh, uh, RC1, there is still something that is has to be uh, fixed uh, in terms of casting, so I prefer not to show you uh, a, a deep example on that. And um, uh, the other final thing is the ability to use the winner at TAPI. I mentioned at the very beginning that we have this uh, full version of the Windows SDK. This means that uh, as soon as you specify this, you automatically have generated by a project that is called CS Winner T, and we will talk this in another uh, in the future because it's in, they are still working on it, but it is extremely promising. They you get automatically uh, generated the interoperability layer to Winner T, and this means that this uh, project is also able to in, uh, create the interoperability for any Winner T component, also yours or COM component. And you can automatically access all the APIs as documented in, uh, in, in the projects, uh, in, uh, in the documentation of Microsoft. So I only specified this, and you can go in, uh, the, in a WPF application and uh, access the locator, uh, the geolocation of, of the machine. And uh, you don't have to specify anything else. You don't have helpers. You don't have anything. So I invoke the, uh, the API here. I also can invoke the RSS feed uh, um, uh, APIs that are UWP APIs. And there will be more because this is the foundation of what you will find on the WinUI that Dino mentioned in, 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 in uh, his session. So uh, I am not sure if I am late or not, but uh, I will end here saying that uh, you have to stay tuned and uh, very soon the RC2 and uh, on November 10 there will be .NET Conf with the launch of all this stuff, .NET 5 and C Sharp. If you have questions, I will stop here in the chat to answer uh, as much as I can to all the, the questions. And uh, I invite my fellow code campers to uh, tell me what is next. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. .NET 5 and I, I was not sure if I was late or not. No, ah, you're good. You're on time. We're on time. We're okay, good. okay. We've got time for a couple of questions. First of question would be: What are your top three new features? In My top three. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, record types. Uh, I love them, but um, covariant records uh, are, are another one that uh, I mean, I, I I found myself several times uh, in in, uh, in the business to 
when I really wanted to cover in returns. Uh, I maybe they are not that popular, but my, my best uh, in uh, my top is definitely the function pointers. I really wanted to show you something, but the the, the example that I have and this working is is too complex uh, by mistake. I mean, it's something that uh, is for RC one. It, it it doesn't worth the pain for you to to see. Uh, some garbage uh, in, uh, at this moment, but in maybe in future versions of, of the uh, future uh, code camp, uh, we will talk uh, uh, more deeply about uh, all the interoperability stuff. Because of course, uh, when you want to merge uh, uh, .NET 5 with the Mono and the Xamarin and the Unity, you need a lot of interoperability. One of the uh, major efforts that uh, Microsoft have with, with Xamarin is to keep updated all the interoperability code between uh, Android and uh, uh, C Sharp. And uh, it's a big effort to write by hand. And uh, what they are doing with the CS Winner T, they will produce it automatically. They have a generator. And this is huge. I mean, it's something unbelievable. I want you, I mean, it can take a long time to explain all the stuff, and uh, let, let's let's talk in, in another episode. Let's save it for another conversation. Uh, of some course. specific uh, questions would be uh, if we'll, we're going to have an uh, ahead of time compilation in uh, .NET 5 besides the iOS and web targets. Well, I I went deep dive uh, in the ahead of time compilation because you also have the tired compilation. And there is much to say uh, about it, but it was in button three. So this is the reason why neither me or, or, or Dino talked uh, in, in depth about that. Uh, the tired compilation is something that can intervene in compensating uh, the parts that cannot be compiled uh, fully ahead of time. Uh, there is a huge difference between ahead of time and gen. And gen is something that uh, have to generate uh, 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 that is very tied to the machine that uh, where the generation is being uh, created. While the ahead of time is something that must uh, work even on other machines. So it cannot take a, a specific decision. And uh, since uh, there are some behaviors like uh, generics and so on that uh, have been, must be delayed uh, at uh, runtime, there is this combination of saying, OK, let's use uh, a head of time to uh, make it faster as soon as, uh, as soon as as much as we can. And then uh, let's uh, um, let the, 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 the jitter intervene to compensate those small parts that uh, it will be uh, too bad to make it uh, uh, without uh, uh, with, with a precision indication on the of, of the machine where the code runs. And uh, here is where the tired compilation occurs. If later they see that uh, a, a portion of the generated code can be furtherly optimized and is uh, executed more than 10 times, uh, the tired compilation recompiles again that small portion that is just a method, for example, uh, and uh, uh, give you uh, the pointer to the new optimized method. Uh, this means that uh, you have the benefit to, to having uh, fast booting uh, your application. So you see immediately that is faster in comparison to the jitter. But in, uh, after 10 times that the method is executed, it is a good candidate to be recompiled and uh, also can, can still improve. And this complex is, is pretty complex and I mean, we, we can discuss in, it in details, but it takes a, a long, long more time. All right, uh, I see Dino is still with us. Dino, did you want to mention any final thoughts or? No, I mean, one more, one more final command uh, just to say it's, it's so fun when, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Years ago, I, I just uh, got into a sentence, run into a sentence uh, the, about the Zen of architecture, saying that uh, the young architect sees many options, uh, the older architect is just one option. So uh, this brought to mind back as I heard uh, uh, the top three, 
uh, of roughly which are nearly exactly the same as mine. So it means that either we have the same age or older, both, <laughs> or essentially, yeah, when things are good, they are good to everyone. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's my command. Okay. So, and with that, we're, we're going to thank you both. Thank you, Raffaele. Thank you, Dino. You're welcome. Pleasure to, to have you with us. Looking forward to meet you in Yash or Cluj or yeah. Timisoara or Future. Next of time. Course.